the 70 weeks prophecy. And I hope that you will see during the course of this, uh, the importance of this prophecy and the importance that it holds for understanding what God's up to, but also as a proof of the authority of scripture. And the angle that I want to take when looking at the 70 weeks prophecy is to look at the restoration of Israel. A lot of times you'll hear someone talk about the 70 weeks prophecy and there's a fair bit of uh, talk about, you know, the, the man of sin and the abomination and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm gonna kind of zip through that. In the prophetic book of Daniel, the 70 weeks prophecy is, is part of a series of prophecies regarding the promised restoration of Israel. And these prophetic visions, which we've, we've gone through, tell us as readers, and remember the scriptures say, let the, let the reader hear or let the reader understand. So it's for people to read. And we read that the fullness of Israel's restoration will not be accomplished until the end of the age. They didn't want to hear that, but that was the, that was the truth. And it will come by the power of the coming Messiah. So let me just zip through the uh, oh. let me just zip through the visions that we've already talked about. The vision of the golden image, which is found in Daniel chapter two, and that told us that Babylon and Persia, Greece, Rome will fall. And, you know the giant statue and the the stone cut without human hands. It hits it on the toes and it all topples over. So they will fall before Israel is finally and completely restored. Then we had the vision of the four beasts. That's in Daniel 7. And with that vision, a lot of the same territory is covered, but we're introduced to something new, a little horn, the little horn, which rises up out of the final empire. And that's the man of sin, the lawless one, so forth, who is a relentless persecutor of God's people. And then he is judged and destroyed by the Son of Man, the coming Messiah. All these prophecies end with the Messiah and triumph. Then there was the vision of the ram and the goat. That's in Daniel 8. We went through that. And there we learn about the troubled years of the Maccabean times. And we are told that uh, there's this man, Antiochus IV, and he's a type of the little horn. And by looking at the historical details of this guy, Antiochus IV, we learn something about the nature of the persecution, which is also kind of there for the end time. That takes us right up to the 70 weeks, okay? And Daniel 9. Now, the prophecy is from verses uh, 20 through 27. It's a pretty short prophecy, actually, but there's a lot in there. And in this prophecy, we learn that the Messiah's second coming is twofold. And, we, you know, we can see this now from hindsight. I don't think it was as obvious to the people of the day, but the first and the second coming are baked into prophecy. We learn that it's a twofold coming of the Messiah. First, he comes and he is put to death. Okay, then he will come a second time to pour out judgment on the nations and on the man of sin, all right? So that's a kind of a recap of where we've been as we go through the book of Daniel. And all these visions that, that Daniel has and goes through tell us that Gentile kingdoms, kingdoms of the nations, you know, non-Israel, not nations of God, that they will dominate Israel in one form or another after the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of Israel, they're going to continue to be dominated by these Gentile nations until the time of the end and the return of the Messiah. And only after the end of this, this present age will Israel's restoration be full and complete. And there, there was a restoration that they were looking forward to, and it happened as it was prophesied. They came back to the land, you know, but that wasn't the real deal. So let's take a look at the 70 weeks prophecy, Daniel 9. Before we get into it, let's take a look at a little bit of the, what I'll call prologue, lead up. Daniel is found praying and meditating. And this was basically what I went through last time. I spoke here on Daniel looking at Daniel's prayer of confession and so forth. He's found praying and meditating 
and he's meditating about a prophecy. So he, he's talking about some other prophecy in Scripture. He's talking about a prophecy about the, the end of, of the exile. It's a prophecy from Jeremiah concerning Jerusalem's restoration after 70 years. Okay, and we went through that previously. That's in uh, Jeremiah 25 and 29 which says that the 70 years of Babylonian captivity will come to an end. So it says here in Daniel 9, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahusserus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. So he confesses for the sins of the nation. The year that this is happening is 538 BC. And at that time, and I, again, I went through this in more detail previously, but just as a recap, at that time, the 70 years were almost up. Time was coming. And big things were happening. Big, big things were happening. This man, Darius, was now officially installed as the king of Babylon, you know, sort of a, a sub-king in the Persian, vast Persian empire, he was ruling over the uh, Babylonian territories. So here he is, and a decree goes forth, all right? A decree goes forth, and we can read about that in Ezra, 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And it says, the people can go back to the land. So Daniel's seeing all this, and it's coming to pass in his own day, and he's, I think he's, he's excited about it, but he's also concerned about it. So this is, this is the setting here. But what's happening is this promised restoration that was there in the prophecy of Jeremiah, it's coming to pass, and this is super exciting. And as he's praying, Daniel receives a new vision from Gabriel. All right, let's take a look at that by going over to verse 20 and read through 23. It says, Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision in the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the same time as the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. And at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. And then, boom, he goes into the vision. Okay? And this vision is telling him something, and that's the theme that I have. It's telling him something about the restoration of Israel, which is that the, this, this restoration of Israel that takes place after 70 years of Babylonian captivity, and then they get to go back to the land, and it's rough sledding, you know, and we've gone through that in the past. What this prophecy is telling him is that's not the real deal. It is a restoration. It is a restoration. But the restoration of Israel that's prophesied by Jeremiah is not complete. It's not the final restoration. The full and final restoration of Israel will come only after a countdown of 70 sevens, meaning 490 years. Okay? That's verse 24. So Gabriel says, here I am, I'm going to tell you some stuff that's going to give you understanding. And then he launches into this very short prophecy, but which has a lot to say to us. So verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. That's kind of a laundry list of spiritual uh, goals that, that God baked into this prophecy. We'll, we'll come back to that at the end of the message. But for the time being, let's take a look at these, these 70 weeks. So it says 70 weeks are determined. Wow. Okay. Okay. 
we go into the historical fulfillment of this, let's, let's first read Daniel 9, verse 25 and 26. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, so that's hearkening back to this command that went out from Darius saying, hey, this is all going to come to pass. Okay, from that time to, uh, to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Okay, so the 490 year countdown begins with this proclamation to restore Jerusalem, right? That happened, that began in 457 BC with a proclamation that went out from a man named Artaxerxes and that's recorded in Ezra chapter 7, verses 12 through 26. A proclamation that says, okay, let's go and rebuild, the, you, you guys let's, can go and rebuild the temple. This is a different proclamation than the one that we, were, we referred to earlier. This one says, all right, let's rebuild. So this is the proclamation that's being addressed here in verse 25 from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So this happened in 457 BC, and you can read about it in Ezra 7, verse 12 through 26. So let's do the math, okay? Let's do the math. The 490 years is broken down into segments. There are seven sevens, and then there are 62 sevens, and then there's one final week which you can read about in verse 27, and we'll come back to that later. Just trust me for the time being, okay? And the first two segments here, okay? Seven sevens and 62 sevens. Well, there's 49 years and 430, 434. And those add up to 483 years, right? We're still missing seven years. There's a final week that all add up to 490 years. So we've got segments, okay? These segments really are important. So the 490 years is broken down into segments, 62 sevens, or sorry, seven sevens, 62 sevens, and then one final week, okay? Now, during those years, the 483 years that I, I put in red so you'd kind of see it and, and, and kind of pay attention to it. During those years, the second temple in Jerusalem is rebuilt. And we've gone through that in the past, looking at, for example, the book of Haggai. And then 483 years after that proclamation that went out in 457 BC, something really spectacular happens. Here's the proclamation, 457, and then 483 years later, in 27 AD, Jesus begins his ministry. Now, remember, there's no year zero, so you have to have a year adjustment there, okay? Prophecy is, a prophecy is fulfilled. But wait, there's more, because that's not the end of the prophecy, obviously. But within the, you know, segments of the 490 years, there's something very significant that happens from 457 to 27 AD, 483 years, Jesus begins his ministry. That's pretty spectacular in my opinion, okay? This is an amazing fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now, what's more is, beginning with a three and a half year ministry, starting in 27 AD, that places the crucifixion in 31 AD which is the date that the United Church of God and other churches of God teach. And it's the only day, or the only date, sorry, that places the Passover on a Wednesday in that year and uh, then allows for a full three days 
and three nights in the tomb. As taught by the United Church of God. And you know, you, you've probably heard us go through this at Passover once or twice, you know, we go through this, the three days, the three nights, it's a sign. But it's also tied into this very important prophecy in Daniel, which is one of the few prophecies that actually gives us numbers to work with and historical um, markers, like the proclamation. Uh, the symbolism also here is really interesting because uh, Jesus' crucifixion it happens in the, mid, in the middle of the week, just like in the prophecy that we find in Daniel. Minor point, minor point. Okay, so that is pretty cool. That's a pretty significant fulfillment. That takes us to the last week in the prophecy. So we're, we're gonna stick with Daniel. The last week. So you're in Daniel, go to verse 27. We read in verse 26, sorry, I'll go back to 26. It says, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Okay. Now, if you read in verse 27, it says, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So after the 483 years, right, there's still this one final week, okay? We need that to get us to the full 490 years. And this final week is really significant and it's divided in half. Notice the phrase in the middle of the week. It's cut down the middle, if you will. The first half of the week is the three and a half year ministry of Jesus Christ. What's half of seven? Do anyone remember their fractions from, from grade school? What is half of seven? Three and a half, yeah, 3.5. You can, you can read. <laughs> yeah, it's three and a half. So at the end of his ministry, in the middle of the week, the Messiah is cut off, okay? He is put to death. That's what, that's what it's talking about. And it says, not for himself, but for the sake of others, which is what we understand about Christ's death. And through his death, he establishes a new covenant, right? It says, he shall confirm a covenant. And through his death, he establishes, or established, if you will, the new covenant, which puts an end to all further need for blood sacrifices. So I'm going to go to Hebrews 10, just to tie this in to its fulfillment. Hebrews 10 verses 8 through 12 say this, previously uh, saying sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you, that being God, did not desire nor had pleasure in them, but they are offered according to the law. And then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And he takes away the first, that he may establish the second. And by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. A sacrifice that does away with all further need for any more animal blood sacrifices. Verse 14 for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he said before, this is the covenant, so there's that new covenant that's coming to pass through the death of Jesus. With this, the covenant that I will make with them after these days, said the Lord, I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds I write them. And then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's what happens, that's what's told, foretold in the 70 weeks prophecy. And it all comes to pass right on schedule. And it says that uh, he will confirm a covenant. And the word confirm means to strengthen. 
actually, when you get into looking at the Hebrew. The word confirm means to strengthen, so he will strengthen the covenant. The, the new covenant, the New Testament covenant, is described in, in the book of Hebrews in multiple places as the better covenant, right? A better covenant built on better promises. It is stronger, better. Hebrews 8, verse 6. Uh, you'll see the, if you do a word search, you'll see the, the phrase, the concept better is used a lot in the book of Hebrews. It says, uh, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry in as much as he is all, also the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So the new covenant is put in place right on schedule, right on time, and it is confirmed. It is strengthened. It is better. Okay. At this point in, in the prophecy of Daniel, the week stops. It stops right in the middle. And the second half of the week has been postponed. Okay. And this movement that the that Daniel's thinking of and praying about and considering this movement towards the full and complete and final restoration of Israel stops. It stops. It just grinds to a halt. Why didn't it happen? What happened? Why didn't, you know, after the 483 years and then you got the three and a half years, how come it didn't just like happen? Why isn't this something that's 2,000 years in the rearview mirror? It stopped. It was postponed. That's why my little red light is there. Stop. Okay. Why? Why did it stop? Well, what happened was, and I, I think you basically know this, the Messiah came from God. This is Jesus. And he came to the people with an offering of restoration. You know, and think of that time when he was looking out over Jerusalem and he said, oh, Jerusalem, what is the matter with you people? Here I am and you won't have me, right? He came to them with an offer of restoration and reconciliation, and what happened? Israel rejected the Messiah and they put him to death. They killed him, they executed the anointed one. He was put to death, he was cut off. And then their restoration is put on hold because they would not have their king. We have no king but Caesar. Isn't that what they said? We won't have you as our king. And as a result, God's offer of reconciliation was closed to them, but then it was opened up to all the other nations on the earth. And this takes place through the church. Through the church. And this gathering in of all the Gentile nations, nations of the earth, is for a set period of time, which I personally think the New Testament refers to as these last days, different, different issue. But the second half of the week will come. It will come and Israel will be restored. Go to Romans 11. Let's start in verses uh, 1 and 2. Paul says, Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. He says, For I myself am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Okay. Verse 11. I say then, have they, that being Israel, have they stumbled so that they, uh, sorry, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, because something happened, this postponement happened, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles, the other nations of the, of the earth. Now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fulfillment, their fullness? Verse 15. Verse 15. 
For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Drop down to verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. Remember, he's writing this to Romans. You might have thought, well, <laughs> we're the new chosen people. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jer uh, Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Their calling to be the chosen people is irrevocable. So the full restoration of Israel has been put off until the end of the age. And then after a lot of suffering and tribulation, Israel will be prepared to accept their Messiah. Now the duration of the postponement is unknown. I have my theories, other people do. The duration is unknown. But punishment upon Israel is not forever, as we read in, Ro in Romans right there. It's only for the time decreed, all right, which is the interval between the first and the second half of the final week. And during that time, Jerusalem lies desolate, and it is trampled under the feet of the Gentile nations, the other nations of the, of the world. Uh, just take a quick look at Luke 21, verse 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That also has a, a dual meaning, but we'll stick with just the one for now. Now we read, if we, when we read 26, I left off a little part of it. Let, let's go back and read it again. It says, after the uh, 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And then it goes on. And it says, the people of a prince to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war's desolation, sorry, and until the end, war, desolation, war and desolation are determined. Okay. There's a ruler who will come. It's not Jesus Christ. It's someone else, a ruler who is to come. The 70 weeks prophecy, yeah, they talk about the Messiah as a prince sent by God to his people, but at the same time, another prince rises up from among the people of the earth, and this other prince is the ruler who is to come, the prince to come, okay? He's a destroyer. He is a destroyer, and his actions are geared towards the ruin of Jerusalem rather than its restoration. And the followers of this ruler, the people of this ruler, will destroy the city of Jerusalem and the temple. Okay. What happened was after Jesus' execution, 40 years actually afterwards, uh, the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Okay. And by decree, which we read through here, by decree, desolation was decreed. So by decree, the site of the temple would remain a place of desolation until the time of the end. Has anyone ever been to the Temple Mount? Anyone? One? I've been there. You've seen pictures at least. It is a site of desolation to this very day. It remains desolate. People would like to do stuff up there, but it is desolate. It's a, it's nothing. By decree, also, battle and war will surround Jerusalem up until the time of the end. Well, if you follow history, if you follow news, you know that's the truth. 
I mean, how many missiles are pointed at Jerusalem right now? I mean, it's been desolate. It's been covered with war. I mean, that's what the Crusades were all about, fighting about Jerusalem. It's been surrounded by war. Now, obviously, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD was not the time of the end, right? <laughs> you know that. It is not the time of the end. But it was the beginning of the desolation, the desolation that is decreed for Jerusalem up until the time of the end, the time of postponement, if you will. However, just as the Messiah comes once and then there's a second coming, all right, so too armies will once again surround Jerusalem for battle. We usually go through this at the Feast of Trumpets. I'll just give you the scriptures. That would be Zechariah 14, verses 2 through 5. which says his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The armies will gather, earthquake, people running to and fro. You could also read Joel 3, verse 12. The armies will be gathered into the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is a valley that's a few miles just north of Jerusalem. You could also read Revelation 16, verse 16, which says they're going to gather in a place called Armageddon, which is basically the big field north of Megiddo, which is north of Jerusalem, where the armies will gather and stage themselves for a big attack, big war. So it's going to happen again. There's a duality to all this. But let's move on, because I want to stick with the time here. So the second half of the week, we read through Daniel 9, verse 27, part B, says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, it means it comes quickly, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. All right. So after the middle of the week, there's a couple of additional events that are they're there. They're part of the prophecy. One is that there's, uh, there's going to be an abomination. So let's go to verse 27 where it says, okay, in the middle of the week, Jesus will be executed, bringing an end to sacrifice. And then it says, and on the wing of ab abominations shall be one who makes desolate. And even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolator. So I'm using the, the King James there, which is a little, um, it doesn't flow nicely, but it's a whole lot better than the NIV, which basically takes it in a totally different direction, which I didn't like. So there's a couple of things that need to happen. After the middle of the week comes to pass, there's this abomination which makes desolate, and there's a complete destruction poured out upon the one who causes the desolation, the desolator, if you will. That's, that's really interesting. The desolator, that's the man of sin, that's the beast, that's the little horn, all right? It's also off in the future. And this is where events, this is where talking about what's going on here gets a little fuzzy. Because the future, we don't know the future. Anyone know the future? I don't. We understand the stuff that I've talked about already in the 70 Weeks Prophecy pretty, pretty well because it's all done. And you can look back on it and say, ah, oh. but the future, I don't know. I think we have some good ideas about it, but we don't know. So answers are elsewhere in the Bible, okay? But fully discussing the abomination of desolation that comes at the time of the end, or the man of sin, or the beast, would require an entire sermon for both topics, right? Um, those are subjects I'll leave to another day, all right? Today, what I want to do is limit this message to the question of the weeks leading up to the restoration of Israel. So just to recap, we've got after 483 years, 69 weeks, the anointed one comes. That's pretty cool in and of itself, all right? And then for three and a half years, he extends God's offer of reconciliation to the remnant of Judah, and they refuse him and they kill him. 
And that killing of Jesus is the, that's the final sacrifice for sin, right? And so the restoration is postponed until the end time. All right, now some people, some people believe that the second half of the week, the second half of the week that we're considering here, these are just some of the ideas that are out here, okay? Some people will say that the second half of the week comes after the return of the Messiah and the destruction of the ruler to come, okay? And in that scenario, uh, Christ will complete his week of ministry in person, right? So he did three and a half before, he'll do another three and a half, and he'll be the one who does the whole seven, okay? The second possibility is that the second half of the week corresponds to the three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days, that are commonly referred to as the tribulation, okay? And in that scenario, Christ comes at the end of the second half of the week. Those are just two ways you can look at it. But in either scenario, so I don't want to talk too much about that. In either scenario, when Christ returns, Israel comes under the protection of the Messiah, which is a very big deal to a man like Daniel. What's going to happen to my people? At that time, Israel will come under the protection of the Messiah. That's what Daniel was really focused on. And when we looked at what Daniel was praying about and what he was thinking about, uh, he was looking at the spiritual aspect of it. He was, what, when he was praying, he was praying about the sins of the nation. He was confessing the sins of the nation. And uh, I think in some ways that's something that I don't know, maybe we should consider. There's lots of, lots of sins to be uh, prayed about and confessed. I don't know that that's necessarily a biblical mandate, but it's, it's, you know, when you think about sighing and crying for the sins of the nation, I think, you know, just saying, oh, ain't it awful, can get old. Perhaps it's something that ought to be brought into prayer just to confess, to ask God, or let God know that you, you, you see it. I don't know what, I mean, I think events are just gonna you know, move along according to God's plan. But I think it's something to consider in our own personal prayers. So Daniel's kind of got this on, on the mind, right? He's thinking of it from a spiritual perspective. How did we get into this terrible predicament, okay? How can we get out of it? So let's take a look at the spiritual side of Israel's restoration. We've looked at the weeks, we've looked at the timing, it's pretty cool, right? But there's a spiritual side to it. If you go back to the prophecy, when Gabriel starts, he doesn't start with days and numbers and that. He says, 70 weeks are determined for your people, your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The 70 weeks prophecy begins with this address to the spiritual side of what God is up to and what full restoration for Israel actually looks like. And these six points actually line up with Daniel's prayer, which I talked about in the last message that I gave about Daniel, his prayer of confession for the sins of the nation. They line up. And so Gabriel's answering and he's saying, okay, one by one, boom, 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 we're going to go through these, and God is going to deal with it. So I put the scriptural reference you can take a look at, and um, if you want, just ask me and I'll send you this slide and get it all rather than try and write it down. So Israel's got, uh, there's a spiritual side to their restoration, which really is super important. In the millennial setting, Israel is going to accept their Messiah. You know, when the Messiah comes the second time, they'll be ready to receive, receive him and accept him. And at that time, they will take back their role as the flesh and blood representatives of the rule of God on earth. But they're going to need some work. You know, it doesn't just happen. Jesus just shows up and everybody's character just changes. That's not the way God works. You know that. Some work needs to be done. And these six points of spiritual restoration, well, they're off in the future for Israel. 
Okay? This is something that happens when Christ returns for Israel, right? But during this time of the postponement, all these points of spiritual restoration are available to the church and I think are important for the church now. So let's take a look at them. Let's just go through them together, okay? We have got the first one here, which is to finish transgression. Now the word finish can mean put an end to, can also mean to restrain or block. And then there's another word there, which is transgression. Now transgression is a little different from sin. Transgression refers to rebellion and disobedience towards Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. Rebellion and disobedience to his authority and to his covenant. For example, let me give you a primo example of transgression. The Sabbath. Rejection of the Sabbath is rejection of God's authority. The reason we keep the Sabbath on the seventh day, why? Because God says so. There's no other reason to do it the way we do it other than God says so. It's a rejection of God's authority. So Sabbath breaking is an example of transgression, okay? Now the next point says, put an end to sin. Well, an, an end means, it's a slightly different word than was used before. Uh, this one means to stop or to seal up. But the word sin is worth some attention. Sin is a more general term than transgression. And sin can refer to moral behavior, which is self-evident, okay? Uh, rather than that which is stipulated by covenant or received by revelation. Okay, we, we, we understand the Sabbath by revelation, right? But some things you know just by looking at the created world. And uh, so as far as things that are just obvious and everybody should know, go to Romans 1. And Paul spends eh, all of Romans 1 and 2, and yeah, 1 and 2, going through this concept. It's very important. It's not the only place that it's discussed, but this is the best. Uh, if you're in Romans with me, please do. Go to uh, verse 18 and 19. And it says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in, in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. In other words, you can see these things in creation itself. It's uh, commonly referred to as natural law, okay? Common sense is the way that people put it. Uh, go to chapter 2, verse 14, and it says, um, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things of the law, these also not having the law are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law written on their hearts and their conscience. So some people just see stuff. I mean, you can take someone who's not got the Bible, you know, and they understand certain things. Murder, bad. Lying, bad. And you see this across cultures that have nothing to do with the Bible. Some things are just obvious. Sin also refers to not doing the good that we know we should do. Right? So sin has a different aspect to it than transgression. So the next one here, to atone for wickedness. Well, atone, it's a very cool word, uh, although I prefer the Hebrew word, kippur, right? So the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Well, kippur means to cover. It means to cover something over, which has two applications. One is that something is covered by the blood of Christ, 
right? So transgression and sin covered by the blood of Christ. It's also uh, something that we think about during the Day of Atonement when Satan is thrown into the abyss and covered over, right? So kapur, covering over. And then wickedness is mentioned. Covering of wickedness. Um, wickedness is often translated iniquity. Neither of those words really do it for me. I think a better way to understand this is injustice. Injustice. That's what he's getting at. Injustice in the world. And injustice, I mean, injustice can happen, and it's got nothing to do with, with me or you, but it's happening. But somehow by being part of the system, we're responsible by being part of it. That needs to be dealt with. And Christ will judge the wickedness of the nations and make atonement for it. And we'll go through that during the Day of Atonement more thoroughly. Satan must be overcome. Well, these happen on a national level, international level, cultural level, but we're also responsible for dealing with these issues on a personal level, as they might occur in our lives, to atone for wickedness, to apply blood, the blood of Christ, that they be covered over, they can be forgiven, and move on. All right, next spiritual priority, everlasting, bring in everlasting righteousness. To me, this simply means the establishment of the rule of God on earth. Okay, bring in righteousness. And we've seen that Israel will have a role to play, a future role to play, and they will be there when Christ returns. They'll, still, they'll be in the flesh, right? And they'll have a role to play in the flesh during the millennium. But the saints at that point will be resurrected to spirit life, okay? They'll have even more of a role to play. But what about now? Well, right now, the church is preparing people for what is to come. Preparing you now, and you have a part to play in it too. How? How? by establishing the rule of God in your heart and mind today. It does take place in the heart and mind. It just doesn't stop there. Okay, seal up the vision and prophecy. On one level, understanding would be sealed up and it would be closed. And Daniel was told this, you know, go your way, Daniel. You're not going to get this until stuff actually starts happening. But it will become known and understood as the day and the hour approaches. I think that day and hour are coming. I think we know more about prophecy now because we've seen stuff happen. We know about the 483 years. Daniel couldn't have seen that. We can. Okay, so another way to seal up vision and prophecy, they're marked with God's personal seal of authenticity. In other words, the stuff came, the stuff came to pass. It happened after the 483 years. We, it, it's there. It's to be seen. God's personal stamp of authority is on it. You know, and, and, and the record of history shows other prophecies fulfilled. And yet there are unfulfilled prophecies which are equally true and valid. And here's the point. The church must teach on prophetic matters to seal up the vision and prophecy. Part of the church's commission is to teach prophecy. We have to do this. We have to go through prophecy, and we're doing it now, of course. But it is part of our job to teach on prophetic matters, to explain how history intersects with prophecy. You know, you, you might not really think, oh, I don't really want to hear about Persian history today. Well, you, you know, I tried to make it as short and sweet and interesting as possible, but you just heard some Persian history, okay? You need to know these things. Why? Because it shows God's mark of authenticity on the scriptures. And we also need to provide sound interpretation. This is part of our job as the church. We must do these things. Okay, to anoint the most holy place. To anoint means to set aside for religious service. So part of that applies to Israel. They have been set apart for a future role, a special service during the millennial period. But the saints, the saints have also been appointed and sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit and anointed for service. And that service, and I'm talking about you, that service is for now to help the church fulfill its commission 
and a designation for future service in the millennium, when Christ returns, to be seated with Christ and have a role to play. So the most holy, the most holy, well, that usually refers to the holy of holies, okay, which is the place behind the curtain in the tabernacle and then later in the temple. And that can be applied in a variety of different ways. One might be the future temple uh, that's described in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 49, maybe. But it could also apply to believers. It could have a here and now effect or application. Believers who make up the church since they're recognized as the living temple of God. And so you are tasked with becoming holy, overcoming sin, to become like the Father. So, in conclusion, the 70 weeks prophecy, I put it to you, is the essential prophecy in the Bible. I look at it that way. It's kind of like the hinge on which the door turns. I believe it's the essential prophecy of the Bible. It ties into history, Persian history, dry and dusty, but it ties into Persian history with that proclamation, right, which begins the whole process and allows us to figure out the start of the countdown. It provides numbers. Most prophecies don't provide numbers. But this one provides numbers that allow us to then predict which or when events would happen. That is pretty cool. And these numbers correspond with and link up to the time of the crucifixion, which then meshes with the teaching on the three days and the three nights in the tomb, the entire holy day sequence, even the lunar and solar calendar. And as we finished off, it also provides a short summary of God's goals of spiritual restoration, both for Israel and for the church. And all these details of the 70 weeks prophecy are there to validate your trust in the Bible as God's word. And he's given you these things that prove this is my word. It's real. Who else? Who else could have called forth, the, called forth these things before they happened and then brought them to pass? Who else could do that? Why do you let the Bible speak to you on matters of uh, morality or behavior or ethical topics? Why do you listen to the scriptures? Why? Because it provides, the Bible provides ways for you to verify its reliability. That has been the purpose of today's sermon, so that you might believe and have confidence in the Word of God. 